from HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 315, recorded live Thursday, April 19th, 2012. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik, online at T-E-L-E-R-I-K.com. And by Franklins.net, training developers to work smarter. And now offering Gesture Pack, a powerful gesture recording and recognition system for Microsoft Connect for Windows developers. Details at GesturePAK.com. In this episode of Hansel Minutia, Scott talks with Richard Campbell. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. In fact, another episode of Hansel Minutia with Richard Campbell. How are you, Richard Campbell? I am well, my friend. How are you? Lovely. What's on your mind today? Uh, uh, tons of things. Uh, actually, have you seen the, the app Place Me? Place Me? Yeah, so placemeapp.com. Okay, and what is this on? What, uh, what platform? This iPhone. Okay, Place Me app. Okay, looking at it. So here's the story of Place Me. Basically, uh-huh. it's turning on all of the sensors in your iPhone and recording everything to compose a total map of what you do, where you go, and, and roughly, you know, what's going on with you all of the time. Okay. Now, it's, it's private. It's keeping the data to itself. It's not sharing it with anyone. But imagine it's Foursquare, but you don't have to check in, right? Okay, it sounds imagine like that something that's going to use a lot of battery it. for me. Yeah, I I imagine this is a battery challenge, but what I find interesting about this is that this looks like the manifestation of the personal assistant, the the way it should be. You know, what's the the big problem I have with Foursquare is that I only, I get to announce to my friends when I go somewhere as if they would care. (laughs) But if I have this thing working all the time, it knows, you know, when I walked into the Walmart and when I walked out based on the GPS data. Okay. It. One of the things that happens with the way they compose the data is fairly quickly it figures out where you live, where you work, where you usually get gas, where you you know normally go to eat, like all of that stuff. If your phone's on all the time and sensing all that information, it figures all that stuff out quite pretty natively, which I think is kind of cool. You know, the, just this ability. And now you tie that in with, say, your schedule, right? So you're in a restaurant, and this app now knows... You know, you're at a restaurant. Your next meeting's at two o'clock. It's now one o'clock. It knows the because it knows the address of where you need to get to. It knows the route you're likely to take, and it also knows there's an accident that way, so it can warn you you need to leave early because you need to go a different route. Is it that? I mean, it could do that, but is it that sophisticated? I mean, uh, first, it's tracking me, which means I need to trust it. I don't yep. know where they're storing it. Presumably, it's in the cloud at some point. Um. I, other than for an alibi, I'm not quite sure why I need this. <laughs> I I like you know I keep thinking in the context of a personal assistant that the the big thing that happens when you have an assistant for a while is that they start to be able to anticipate need. Right, that's the bigger thing, right? And I, I keep hearing we're going to have these personal agents that are going out finding us best prices for airfares and you know all the stuff we need to do sort of making our life easy, but they don't know enough about us to be able to be effective. Do you really think that's the problem? Because I've had Siri now for, what is it, six months? Yeah. And it's just a hot mess. It really is. I mean, all I can get Siri to do effectively and regularly is call people. Yeah. But, you know, Siri is, I mean, you know, I love my iPhone. I'm a big iOS fan. Everyone knows it. But uh, it's embarrassing. Like, Siri is just, like, the, the, the Siri demo that you do with your families is just a consistent uh, embarrassment. Like it's, <laughs> I mean, I seriously, I, it will not work when my wife is looking at it. It just won't. But I still think that's the metaphor of you giving instructions to a device, right? You demanding something. I like the idea of the passive part of the anticipatory part. You know, you can always ask to have your water glass refilled at the restaurant, but don't you like it better when before your glass is empty, the guy comes by and tops it up again? Sure, sure, until I leave and the water's wasted, but that's just me. Yeah, well, you're not alone with that. I've seen a few people get anxious about those things. I live in British Columbia where we're up to our hip waders in water. But that's what I'm looking for in this agent mentality is you're anticipating my need. 
you know what needs to happen next and can, you know, catch potential problems before they happen. I mean, that's what I like about TripIt. My favorite feature of TripIt Pro is that when I turn my phone back on, when the fo- when the airplane's at the gate, I get a text message tells me what my next gate is. Yeah, that is nice. That is yeah. nice. But in that case, they're charging you 50 bucks a year for it. And that's the thing right. that's kept me off TripIt Pro. Well, yeah, you only have to get the jump on a canceled or delayed flight once before that fifty dollars is so trivial. Yeah, yeah, that's true. This 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 idea though that an application is going to anticipate my need, I feel like we've reached a bit of a plateau in programming languages right now and programming yeah. paradigms where the average programmer has for loops and while loops and if statements and switch statements in at their um uh, at their beck and call, but they can't really move past that. So when I hear that there's going to be intelligent agents that are able to like parse natural language and anticipate and build decision trees, and uh, I'm thinking to myself, I don't think most people know what that code looks like. You know, I mean, yeah. that's one of the things I think is making Connect a little bit difficult to uh, to understand is that for one class of programmer, it's like, hey, here's an amazing uh, byte array that contains depth data, and you can go off and play with it. And for another class of programmer, they're like, okay, I have a whole stream of ones and zeros, and I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. And, and, and you're right. Like Tying it to natural language, I think, is, is not the big issue here. This idea of passively anticipating need, to me, is the most interesting idea. Right. If as soon as I have to order it to do anything, we failed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I want you to take a look at the composite of my behavior and my upcoming requirements, probably primarily from my schedule, and make sure that path goes smoothly. I mean, that's when you talk about a physical personal assistant, somebody who actually is out to assist you, that's what they do when they're doing their job well. They interact with you. You rarely interact with them. Don't you think that it is privacy that is the number one thing that is going to hurt us in all of these situations? I mean... Uh, my wife uploaded a photo on Facebook last week and then a bunch of people that she didn't know started commenting on it and she thought that she'd marked it as friends. Right. But she 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 tagged somebody. And which means it included their friends. Exactly. And that that union, that Venn diagram was not something that she had anticipated. And let me give you an example here. I just, while you were talking, I downloaded Place Me, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, it says... Oh, what's your name? And you're giving me a name and a password. And I'm thinking, okay, cool. I'll give you my name and my password. But the first thing I thought was, how do I know they're not going to send me my password in clear text? Yeah. You know, like, I don't know these guys from Adam. I know them from me because you said. And if I go and say, cool, here's my password. Welcome to place me. Here's your password, Fred. You know, and, you know, my password's Fred. You know, it's like, I don't know their privacy policy. I don't know their, uh, if, if, they're, if they're legitimate. I don't know what they're doing with this. And yep. how are they going to, what are they going to do with this information? You know they're going to track this stuff. They're going to they're gonna sell my personal information. The question is, are they going to sell it as labeled as Scott Hanselman, or are they looking at it in the aggregate? And do you care if they're looking into the aggregate? I don't care if they're looking at the aggregate, but that's the thing. When you go to the hospital, they draw some blood, and they say, would you mind if we use your blood for genetic testing? And you say, well, you know, it's in the aggregate, though, right? They just want to know how general people who are my age and my race and my type do. But yeah. I don't know if they're not going to clone me. They always end up cloning me in the movies. <laughs> the pro- My concern here is we have always given up privacy to certain people, like your personal assistant. I mean, let's face it. The, you, know, you can be having an affair and your wife doesn't know, but your personal assistant bloody knows. True. So the as much as people tend to be fixated on the privacy issue all the time. That's not the compelling part, right? The interesting part about here is when we choose to give up privacy, can we get some real benefit from it? Yeah, I think we can. When we choose to completely give up privacy, of course we can. Well, I I don't think you need to give up privacy. I think the the question here is the constant fixation on it. Like, why are we throwing out the, uh, yes, we'll have a privacy concern. I think it can be addressed. Why are we not going to do this because there's a privacy concern? Well, aren't privacy concerns primarily safety concerns? I think that the privacy concern is going to break down to a couple of things. There are, I want to be safe, meaning I don't want someone showing up at my house for dinner. Yeah. Uh, I want my family and children to be safe. But then there's also the uh, embarrassment. 
people who really want things to be private often have yeah. something that they don't want anyone to know about. Yes. But, yeah, I'm, I'm getting really tired of the privacy debate because it's the same thing over and over again. It's, it's like an irrational fear. I do the internet safety talks for parents. So I've gone researching hard for a case where a stalker has hunted down a child through their Facebook profile and kidnapped them. And I have not been able to find any actual instances of that. No, there come on. There have definitely been kidnappings. On. Someone right? there is going to There definitely been abductions, that, but they're all, it's got nothing to do with public information on Facebook. Mm, yeah, I have to disagree on that. I mean, here we go. I mean, I just found one just by Googling for it, right? Peter Chapman murdered a girl he met on Facebook. Right. Now, again, this is not specific to Facebook. Right. This is and this is her communicating with him. It was a bi-directional. There was a relationship. It could have been done over the phone. It could have been done in a mall. It could have done any number of ways. This is nothing to do specific with the massive privacy violation that is Facebook. Chapman interacted with that kid. That kid made a bad choice at some point. Well, I mean, ultimately, if someone's going to get you, they're going to get you. Is what you're saying? Well, but they, but the pub, you know, random people don't generally kidnap random people. There is a connection between them. Hmm. Okay. I, I don't know. I still think it's important to be careful. And, to be thoughtful. and thoughtful. And who you talk to and who you share information with is a, is a worthwhile discussion, but it shouldn't be paralytic. I agree. Right? I mean, agreed, I'm dealing. But... I'm I'm talking to parents of teenagers who won't let their children on Facebook at home, and are asking me how to keep them from going on Facebook at their friend's place. Yeah. Did you see? Uh, did you see that uh, my post on the uh, the Voxer application and the privacy concerns I had about that? No, tell me about it. So I'm sitting in New Zealand in a hotel, and I'm working on my talk for Webstock. And I had installed at Rob Connery's suggestion an application called Voxer, V-O-X-E-R. And uh, it connects to your Facebook and it sees who else you know who has Voxer. And it's a push-to-talk application. Right. So it's, it's, not a, it's like delayed voicemail. You push a button, you talk, you let go of the button. So I was talking back and forth with Rob and everything works fine. I put the phone down and then suddenly a random person that I do not know sends me a... Uh, a Voxer, a voicemail. And it's happening in real time. So this this person is there doing this right now. Right. So I listen to it, and it's a child. It's like an 11-year-old or 12-year-old child. And they're doing a sing-song kind of schoolyard tease. They're going, Hanselman, who names their kid Hanselman? What's that about, Hanselman? And it's just random childish nonsense. But the child's full name is there. And I'm thinking, who is this person? I don't know this person. Is this someone? I mean, Voxer told me it would only connect me to my friends. Right. Uh, but there's a little red pin by it. And I click on the pin, and it's a public library in, you know, on the East Coast. And, a, and I, so here and now, I suddenly I have the full name of a person, of a, of a child, in a public library, and I know where they are. I could call the library. And yep. talk to this child if I wanted to, and, and they're they're sitting there obviously using the free Wi-Fi of the library. Uh, but I so then I go and Google around for it and find the child's Google Plus account. So now we have an underage, un, you know, under thirteen uh, child who basically is forgotten that information can leak or never taught. Turns out this is the the um, son of a f- Facebook friend. Who's a like an acquaintance of mine, not a friend in the hangout all the time way, but in the we are connected on Facebook. So Voxer has basically, unbeknownst to me, extended the people that it would show my presence to to the sum of all people who are all my friends and their friends. So right. this kid thought he was just getting a list of suggested people and was just pranking them like a pranked phone call. But in the process, leaked his name, his information, his location. And then I, you know, I won Google search. I find this person's, um, Google Plus account. So then anyway, I go on to Facebook and the dad has got his phone number exposed. So I text the dad. I'm like, I think your kid is on the East Coast somewhere. And he explains the whole situation to me. You know, the kid's going to school over there, et cetera, et cetera. I write a blog post about it. It takes about 10 minutes. 
he texts the kid with the blog post, and the kid freaks out and is like, "Oh my goodness, I had no idea." Uh, I'm going <laughs> to stop, stop, stop doing that right away. But the point I'm making is that a should a 13 year old child be taught that they can leak information? That's yeah. an interesting question. And and b should they care? Well, and I think generally you need awareness of uh, your own privacy and and what you're spreading where. Like just that ability to view yourself from the context of others is sort of a fundamental thing of understanding your online persona. That is deep, my friend. That is what <laughs> that is what no, that that is that's the difference between grown and not grown. Being yeah. able to view yourself within the context of others. And I know yeah. grown grown ass men that it cannot do that. I know people in the well, 50s and, and, can't and do I think that. it's we we're raising the generation of kids that uh, have are going to be wrapped in a technology that's going to make that constantly available. This whole idea that you have to own an on, your online persona, and and it, and typically, you know, we talk about that age line at thirteen for Facebook and Google Plus and so forth. Is at the time when a child is trying to define their real persona, their persona persona in in in, in front of people, and are in the process of transitioning from. Uh, peer group of parent to peer group of peers, they also are demanding to do this online as well. That would that is so difficult. I mean, the idea that you're 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 developing who you are as a person, and you're expected yeah. to maintain a personal brand. And I remember bringing up personal branding years ago on the internet, and people thought it was very egotistical. Like, who right. do you think you are that you have a personal brand? But you know, anyone who's got more than ten or twenty links on the web needs to be thinking about, I'm going to go and get this job at Goldman Sachs. Here's a picture of me with a lampshade on my head. I have yeah. not maintained my personal brand. Well, and I mean, I think the pejorative word there is brand because now it associates, you know, with Coca-Cola and the like, but more exactly. just this recognition that your online persona exists. And if you don't know what it is, you know, you're fooling yourself. In theory, I mean, the simplest statement we can make it to to a, a teenager is you really should have your online persona re reflect your, your physical persona. They should be the same. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's yeah. what a mature person does. And you're going to experiment with that as the same way that you do in your physical persona, and you're going to make some mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny that you say that because I, I have probably twice a week uh, random people email me uh, and asking me actually to delete uh, comments that they made on my blog because they used their full name and they were snarky or they were smart asses or they were something and then their employer finds them in an interview and then they, they ask to have them removed. I've even <laughs> had people tell me that their employers would like them to keep a low profile on the web. Like someone actually told me that they want their employer wanted them to not blog because the employer was afraid that they would be pinched by other competitive uh, companies. Like they were looking too competent on the internet. Wow. Yeah, a true well, story. Well, and then there was this whole wave of you if if you want to be employed here, we need your username and password to your Facebook account. Yes, absolutely. That's ridiculous. Did you see um, Reginald Braithwaite did a great parody letter on that where he pretended to be the chief of engineering at a company that did that and basically wrote a whole fictional narrative about uh, where that would eventually go and how all the C-level execs would have to uh, retire and, uh, and quit because you just can't follow that all the way through. You're going to get sued no. if you do that. There's just no way. It's ridiculous. Yeah. No, it's 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 insanity, and it's just it's fear, irrational fears that, that uh, can't be managed effectively. You know, you, you just got to think through what you got to do. Well, and it's more than just fear. It's 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 an inability of regular folks to understand the issues. I mean, just yeah. look at any time a patent of any complexity tries to go through through legal review. Uh, yeah. it's it's just embarrassing to listen to mm -hmm. like the Supreme Court to try to understand something as subtle as can I remove Internet Explorer or not. Yeah. Well, yeah, I feel like the whole patent system is very much like the um, the financial system of of uh, betting on other people's loans. You know, this seems, this thing is fine as long as nobody actually uses any of them. As soon as they do, the whole thing's a house of cards. What uh, What else are you uh, thinking about lately? Uh, I read the book Information Diet. Okay. Have you read this? Informationdiet.com is the website. 
All right. I've heard about and, it, and, and I've, they, I've given talks about ignoring stuff. Like, I yeah, gave a talk. I know, you're, at, you know, I, I realized, I think I, I watched your uh, the talk from New Zealand. Mm-hmm. And uh, and you hit on a few points from the information diet. I thought was really interesting. The, the author's name is Clay Johnson, but you know his essence. The essence of this thing was this idea that cons- you sh- the same way that we conspicuously and consciously consume food, that we you know look at the 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 dietary the the, the nutritional content of food, we should be mm-hmm. consuming data the same way. That there is a plethora of poor quality, or as he describes it, pizza information out there, and you want the broccoli information. That is cool. That is, I like that idea. I mean, I, I look as as a diabetic, I'm always looking at the ingredients. I mean, I want to know what the corn syrup equivalent of information is, so that I can avoid. Yes. It. Well, and 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 I also appreciate that his approach to talking about this tears down the conspiracy theory stuff. Right. And gets back to look who's being paid for what. So, you know, it, as much as we recognize t- television news is no longer news, it's entertainment. Right. The, and the motivation there is very clear. The people who pay for the news are the advertisers. And the advertisers only care about the number of people who can see their ads. And so you need to construct your news show to increase viewership. And the way you do that is not by presenting the news. You do it by affirming your audience. And so he pretty clearly goes through the process of how you render news to make it affirming to your audience. Mm, Well, and also assuming that they're not idiots is nice. Well, turns out idiots buy stuff too. (laughs) That is unfortunate. Some Some would say buy more stuff. So... If you could actually gather them all together in one place with one set of shows, then, you know, you could sell a lot of stuff because in the end, that's their job, right? That's what they're out to do. Yeah, that's a touchy point for me. The whole, we're selling too much stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the basic line cross there is this idea that news shows need to generate advertising revenue. That's the line. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And but exactly. we crossed that line a very long time ago. You know, the other thing I realized and and he and Johnson sort of highly brought this up as well is the fact that remember when all the newspapers were gonna go out of business? It just sort of stopped happening. Right? Newspapers have stopped going out of business. Well, Why well, that is means that? that people will up to a point buy dead trees. Well, I don't think I don't even think it's the tree part, it's that they've restructured their businesses to be a lot less expensive. Well, then that must mean that the quality has gone down. Why, you would be correct, sir. They do the <laughs> same thing that many other news the other news a- angles are going on, and the internet does as a whole. They don't produce any news. They just parrot it. So fewer and fewer real news sources and more and fewer and fewer reporters working for newspapers, they're just pulling in the sources of news that come from other places, putting their spin on them, and republishing them. Right, right. You see, like, some someone will write an incorrect article and throw it on the Associated Press, and then the AP feed just gets read by a talking head, and at that point, a mistake has become news because no one's actually doing any due diligence anymore. Two sites you'd probably appreciate. One is called Churnalism.com. Churnalism? Yes, yeah, so C-H-U-R-N-A-L-I-S-M.com. Churnalism.com. Okay. So, you know, I have the anti-plagiarism sites where you can take your, your pa- a paper someone sent you and, and run it, and it'll compare it and show you where it came from? Right. And there's services that teachers can, can subscribe to that will tell them whether or not kids are doing that. Exactly. Journalism.com, same thing for journalism stories. So, you take a story, you paste the text in, and it compares it to related stories. And it should show you generally sources for where these stories come from. Interesting, interesting. I, I, I would be nice to see like a bookmarklet or some kind of an add-in that would do that all the time. So I right, could find I'm totally with you. Yeah, I want to know if I'm reading rehashed stuff. It doesn't always get a match. You know, they, it's not, this isn't far from perfect, and it doesn't have every single source of, of press from anywhere. But it, every, when it does get a match, it's really interesting to see the side-by-side versions. Here's the version you've got. Here's a couple of other reference versions that are clearly the same thing. Here's what's removed. Here's what was added. 
Yes, exactly, exactly. There's a there's an application that I use to keep track of whether or not, um, whether or not people are kind of stealing, borrowing, reblogging my content. It's yes. called FairShare, and they'll actually create a uh, an RSS feed and say we found you know a really really similar story at this URL, and it's using seventy percent of your content. Uh, out of you know x number of words out of the words that you published, except they've added ads, they've stripped out your ads and they've added them. So it's one right. thing to say, I like your stuff, Scott. I'm going to blog part of it, or I'm going to use 250 words and link back to you, which I encourage. It's another thing to take all the content, remove my ads, and put in your own. Yeah. So then you get something for nothing, and I get nothing for all that work. Now are we talking about fairshare.attributor.com. Exactly, exactly. You can subscribe to that. It'll watch your feed and it'll watch the world and then it'll tell you whether or not your stuff's popping else, popping up. Right, here's elsewhere. the bad news. I just went there and they've shut down as of February this year. That would explain why I am not getting any reports lately. Are they seriously <laughs> gone? Oh, man. Ah, it funny. sucks. Fair shares and discontinued. Oh, man. Ongoing operational costs. Oh, man. Now i got to find another one. Yep. It was such a great... Oh, man. And it's exactly what you want. It's exactly right. what I wanted because what was nice is that I always recommend in my blogging talks that people should uh, license their content. And sure. what I want to do is say, you can use this, but not for commercial reasons. And then they'll say, well, they've just done exactly not that. They've taken your stuff and they've added a bunch of ads for themselves. Oh, that's a bummer. All right. Well, and, forget I, mean, I said I love that. that they publish it as a free service, but wouldn't you pay... <laughs> $50 a year pay, for that? I'd, I'd pay 50 bucks a year for something like that. No question. It was sure. an extremely useful service. Yeah. I, I just It confuses me that you wouldn't monetize this. Uh, well, and this is the other thing, right? <laughs> no one will pay for anything anymore. It's just getting <sighs> ridiculous. I talked well, about this before. Well, and it means that things I, like fair share go away. Yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, it, herein lies the consequences. And it, I think it's one of the tougher points that Johnson gets to towards the end of information diet is this idea of we need to start paying for good quality information or we, it's just going to die. Well, we need to simply pay for good quality, period. I am shocked at the yeah. number of people who will not spend 99 cents for an application that someone worked on for hours. And they'll sit there and they'll drink a $5 coffee yeah. While they are researching the reviews on a 99 cent application. Yeah. And I'm seeing constantly um, open source and open source slash commercial software shut down because people won't support them. I mean, if you use a library that you love or there's a product that you paid uh, $99 for and it's like yep. a fundamental to your business, you should tip the guy for God's sake. Yeah. You know? What are you thinking? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll give you two stories related to this where we, where we, where I've spent money and it's served me well. First one was Trillion. Mm -hmm. Way back at the beginning, when when it wasn't sh obvious that MSM was going to dominate the the instant messaging, I was yeah. an ICQ user. I had you know Yahoo and so forth. And Trillion brought all this into one place. Right. And way back in that early version, and this is literally in the XP days. Yeah. I sent them fifty bucks. That's just because nice it was just like, hey, guys, thanks. This saves me a lot of grief because back then those apps didn't get along. You couldn't even run them all at once. And uh, they put me on a, a list that to this day I get nice notes from them and, and new versions and so forth. And they've gone through many, many versions of Trillion now. It's really evolved. They're the uh, I still use the product. Um, I went away from it for a while, but I came back because they finally integrated Skype into it in a useful way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's pure quality. That was yet another app I wanted to get off my my desktop when it came to messaging and phone and stuff. So just having one app for all those things. So the, now just recently, you'll be, this is the you. So you, and you've met my wife, so you know she's in the garment industry. She knows how to do uh, pattern design and and making clothing fit people properly. I mean that's really the thing she does better than anything else. So she found she decided she needed to have a plotter. Hmm. Expensive piece of machinery. No two ways about it. Yeah, absolutely. and through. Through a friend of a friend, found a 10-year-old Hewlett Packard 750C plotter. Okay. Now, it had been beautifully maintained, uh, and literally the guy was letting it go because he wasn't using it enough. He had a new plotter. It was his backup plotter. It's like, I just can't justify letting this thing sit here. It's such a good plotter. And this, it's a beautiful machine. It's, a, it's 100 pounds worth of, of hardware. This is back when Hewlett Packard still used metal in their printers. 
It is a great piece of machinery. Yeah, absolutely. Not supported in Windows 7 at all. See, that's tragic. Just, yeah. But it's not, it's not yeah. Windows 7's fault. It's the driver nope. guy. Just, they, they don't care about that anymore, right? No, they don't. Found a company in Australia called Winline. And they make plotter drivers. Oh, see? I love that. When people take a product and bring it back to life, yeah. I will pay them. Not free. In fact, not cheap. 200 bucks for the driver. But see, if you've got a multi-thousand dollar metal quality plotter that you love and your business relies on it, that's a bargain. And, and this is the... I sat down and did the math with the wife, and we're just talking this through. I can stand up a little machine, you know, running XP with the Hewlett Packard driver, and mm -hmm. you'll have to use that machine every time you want to print. So you'll generate your files on your big fast machine, and you'll take those files, transfer them to this machine, and we got to keep all that stuff running. Mm -hmm. Or... 200 bucks and it was try before you buy right you can download Love the driver it. and run it and it just prints a watermark on anything you plot until you pay, pay get the license to pay for the driver so we so i install it and then i'm used to the battle of drivers right i'm mm -hmm. an expert at this i install the driver it comes up it says what kind of plotter have you got we got an hp 750 650c it says is this the jet direct id of it because i already had it hooked to the network and i go yeah that's it plots on it done that's fabulous. It worked exactly the way. And it's the best 200 bucks I've ever spent, I swear. I mean, that is not... It, you, and everything about that upsets you, right? At your gut, it's like, driver should be free. Driver should be free, right? Like, app should be 99 cents. Driver should be free. It's like, no, for two... That was worth way more than $200 in terms yeah. of quality of life. I don't think and drivers need to be free for worked. something like that. I mean, I've got a um, a space orb which is one of the greatest 3D game controllers ever created. And mm -hmm. I've been struggling trying to get that thing to work in Windows, just plug it in. If someone would write a driver that would just work, just plug it in and it works on like an Xbox controller, I'd pay 100 bucks for that. It's a fantastic piece of hardware that's dead. And there's yeah. a black market for them on eBay, but uh, we always struggle to get them to do anything. Yeah, it's, it's tough. I want to make one more call back to information diet. We were talking about, you know, lies on the internet and the propagation. Have mm -hmm. you ever been to gullible.info? Uh-uh. Oh, are you going to make me gullible? You'll love this. This is just okay. your kind of site. Okay. I'm there. So, gullible.info is literally just sort of proof of the problem of search engines and, uh, and you know, data propagation. Everything on gullible.info is a lie. <laughs> it's all false. Every single thing is false. They're just facts posted routinely that are false. And yet, take any of this any of the, the the these points and search on them and you will find them propagated. Right, often right. into Wikipedia. Here's one. The sale of 1% milk has declined nearly 26% since the beginning of the Occupy Wall Street protests. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to search for that. Search it. And exactly as it is. And I can find... Let me see. I'm going to put quotes around it to make sure that that's not... There's 500 other places on the internet that that has been copy-pasted. <laughs> awesome. So there's a story about uh, one of the one of the statements. This is from a couple of years back. Was uh, Timothy Leary invented a new color? <laughs> and some overachiever on Wikipedia, expanding the Timothy Leary re reference, just grabs that, sticks it in Wikipedia, and then a newspaper in the UK doing their quote fact checking goes to Wikipedia, adds that fact to a story. Oh my goodness. That yeah, that's pretty awesome. That's that, that that makes it very difficult when the when the whole internet is a big joke, though. Well, I, I mean, yes, it, it, well, there is this sense of if you're not re, how do you actually check for facts on the internet? How do you really do it? Yeah, well, remember that it, it, that is that is a skill. Just like re recognizing that information can leak, yeah. uh, being being savvy and knowing that things smell bad, that yeah. don't quite smell right. That is a skill itself well, that people need to yeah. learn and children need to learn. Yes. And I think it's part of, part of the, you know, I've been showing these sites to parents and just saying, you should, and sending them to Snopes, you know, just 
when I see these old arguments come back through, you know, being propagated by family members, for example, I don't argue with them anymore. Just send them the Snopes link. It's yeah. like, look, this this has been run down, and I don't need to talk about it anymore. <laughs> I always hate being the bad guy, though. I always get accused amongst the family as being the guy that's like, you know, I'll get that. Is this true? Is this true? No, it's not. Bill Gates is going to give us all $1,000 if we email him? <laughs> no. Why do you get it? No. And, th- and then I'm the downer. I'm the bad guy. Yeah. You're no fun. I saw a great tweet from one of our friends. I can't remember which one it was. He says, I'm glad I'm at a place where all of my friends are mature enough using email that there are no more joke emails going around in my life. Uh, I've got a couple, couple of uncles, a couple of third cousins. But yeah, Still for the most part, I'm almost there. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't, you can't force them to grow up. You have to just give it, you have to just give it enough time. Eventually, they figure it out. Exactly. Well, thanks for hanging out with me today, Richard Campbell. Always a pleasure, my friend. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, Hansel Minutia with Richard Campbell. We'll see you again next week. Mm